Hey everyone, hopefully you're having a good day. My name's Andy, my channel is Finding Value. Uh, we got a lot to cover today. Uh, we're going into the energy markets, mainly oil. Uh, I'm gonna put, well, I read an article, the article was very well laid out. Very good article, I'll put the link below of that article if you guys wanna follow along using that link. Um, it was on, can't remember what it was on, uh, Seeking Alpha, Seeking Alpha. Uh, this person put together basically the whole gamut of what's coming up in oil from a whole bunch of different areas. So I think this person did a very good job uh, of laying this thing out. And I'm going to go over it with the, the channel. Uh, I kind of took snippets from it. I'm going to read some of it and kind of skip through some of the, you know, all, all the, the words in it and then focus on the charts. Uh, but a lot of the charts here, guys, <laughs> it's, it's coming. Uh, it's coming. And I think we're going to see uh, a lot higher oil prices. The, the article is very well in line with kind of how I'm thinking uh, this could potentially play out. So let's let's dive in here. Uh, we'll start it off with uh, the historic oil bull market will reward buyers of energy equities. It was this was written yesterday, December 8th. Uh, I'm recording this December 9th. Um, we're in a multi year bull market for the energy markets. What's happening in Europe right now via the natural gas crisis will be hitting the oil market soon. Energy equities remain incredibly cheap. Uh, this idea was discussed more in depth with members of my private investing community. Um, so I'm going to go and, and just kind of hit on some highlights here and, and hit a lot of the uh, the charts. Uh, so record high UK energy fuel costs have bankrupted 22 retail electricity suppliers, affecting nearly 4 million households. Uh, the heart of the matter is that UK power grid has become over dependent on the unreliable wind while at the same time reducing fossil fuels and nuclear power generation. That's kind of what he thinks is the uh, root cause kind of. Uh, and Britain is set to end the use of coal within three years and make power generation free of fossil fuels by 2035. But for now, it falls back on high emission coal when wind drops or demand increases. Wind generation on Monday was meeting just 6% of total demand. National grid data show while gas contributed 55% and coal 2%. This is the, the UK power uh, generation fuel mix from 98 to 2020. You can see that it was mainly fossil fuels back all the way up to about 2010. And then we started to, well, they did. They started to ramp up wind, especially a little bit of solars ramping up, uh, bioenergy, net imports are also going up quite dramatically. This down here is your uh, fossil fuels, and they are trying to replace all these fossil fuels by the year 2035. Uh, so they're very fossil fuel dominant. I would say it's probably a little under 70%. Uh, and they're trying to ramp this up, and they're hitting problems. And you'll, you'll see these problems as we go through uh, all these charts. Uh, this is Germany electric generation capacity by fuel type. Uh, we've got other other renewables, which is in the blue. Solar, solar's ramped up quite dramatically since the mid 2000s. Wind has ramped up quite dramatically. Natural gas has ramped up. Nuclear has ramped down, and coal has ramped kind of somewhat down, but it's been remain remaining pretty uh, pretty stable. Now, by looking at this mix on the right hand side, this is what their power gains in terms of how much they pay for power has happened over time. This is just looking at 2021. Uh, it's shot higher, got a nice little pullback. We're coming back up again uh, in November. This is euros per megawatt hour. Obviously they were below, I'd say they're about below 50 back here, about 40, 30. Uh, now they're up around 200. They're, ha they're hitting problems and they're going to remain. A lot of people think that the energy crisis will remain quite elevated uh, given this unreliable, um, power generation, and the inability to store electricity. We've got the German government plans to eliminate coal power generation by 2030. Uh, it is in the process of shutting down the whatever nuclear power uh, nuclear plant by year end. Like in the UK, it expects solar, wind, and natural gas to fill the energy supply void created by the shuttered plants. Not surprisingly, when it comes to electricity prices, Germany's results are similar to the UK's, and then we just went over that. Coming back down, European natural gas production from 2011 to 2021 has been declining. This is a left to right on a decline. I should say, uh, yeah, left to right decline. Uh, this decline is not helping them. That's why natural gas is becoming uh, 
in their inventory levels are being depleted is because they're switching more to natural gas and producing less of it. Not a good mix if that's what you want to do. Um, uh, looking at the left here, natural gas and fertilizer prices, they remain pretty stable throughout the, the time till 2021. And now we're, we're doing a moonshot. We're hockey sticking. We're hockey sticking higher. Will this remain elevated the entire time? I don't know that. This may come back and then do massive uh, boom bust cycles very quickly. Uh, so I do think it's going to come down in the summer over there and then rocket higher again if they don't fix their problems. Or maybe it stays elevated because they can't generate the power uh, from the renewables depending on their renewable power generation. Moving on the right here, it says, for one, they have dis disincentivized the production and storage of fossil fuels. As a result, natural gas has been declining in European nations, making themselves more reliant on natural gas. In the U.S., for instance, California, Texas, and New England are likely to experience energy supply shortages after years of instituting similar energy policies. New England's grid operator recently warned about its dependence on high-cost LNG imports over the winter. Despite the region's proximity to one of the most prolific natural gas producing regions in the world in uh, Pennsylvania. Looking at European inventory levels for natural gas, look at this thing. Coming on the low side, blew out the bottom of the uh, standard deviation kind of average. The, I think this is a five year, yeah, it's a four year average. Blowing out to the downside, and guess what? They're not coming back. We're not, they're not, they're, I mean, they need to hold here. If this thing dives down this winter, good luck. Um, it says the end result is an emerging energy system based on wind and solar that's prone to interruption when the wind dies down, when energy exporters fail to deliver, uh, or when competition for scarce supply causes a price spike, which they're, we're, happen we're having all of this right now. China, uh, China's having the same problems. They just, they just can't get enough energy, period. Uh, well, um, looking down here. This is the energy crisis here. This is the Dutch front month gas. They're obviously having problems as well. Uh, this is Brent crude. It's coming up. We've Obviously, we can read technical analysis. You can draw a trend line through this guy right through here. It's breaking to the upside. This thing's ready to go. Good luck. It says, oil supplies crisis, by contrast, will prove extremely difficult to alleviate over the long term. Since the oil market supply challenge arise from long-term supply constraints, they will not be remedied by market forces or government decree. In the end, it will be high oil prices, not government policy, that will drive a market-based transition to alternative fuel sources. It will not be government policy, but it will be high oil prices that drive it. Going to the left here, this is the U.S. energy consumption by fuel. Looking at what's ramping up, they've got coal ramping down quite dramatically. Nuclear has been quite, I would say, stable. Uh, hydro and liquid fuels have been stable. Other renewable energy has been ramping up dramatically. Natural gas has been running it up the, up the wazoo. Uh, and petroleum has been very good and strong, going all the way out to 2050. So they've got oil remaining strong, but they're not investing in oil. This is setting up to be a massive problem in the future for oil. And natural gas has been going up which is having a, a natural gas crisis. So in my opinion, it's kind of like cheating to buy these natural gas and oil companies because that's what's going to be in the highest demand. If you replace it with more renewable energy, you're just going to tax natural gas and oil more. It's almost like we're just taking these out of the mix. I think nuclear is going to get ramped up again, uh, but these two are getting hit pretty hard for, in terms of demand and supply. Coming on down here, this is the world uh, oil products demand. Uh, you can see 2021 in the red here coming on up. Uh, this is 2022 forecast, and it's coming above the range uh, on the high side. So we are having higher and higher demand for oil products. Coming in the middle here, it says over the next uh, 12 to 18 months, a jet fuel demand recovery stands to add one and a half million barrels of oil per day of oil demand. In addition, an increasing uh, commuting activity is likely to add an additional 500,000. Uh, 500, Points to a 200 million barrel per day of pent-up oil demand set to return as conditions normalize. Here is the demand for jet fuel still below uh, pre-COVID levels. This is jet and kerosene. This is going to ramp up uh, over time. 
looking at this, with oil supply outside the U.S. and OPEC likely to be flat or in decline going forward, U.S. shale and OPEC will continue to be the only game in town when it comes to new oil supply. Future supply growth will therefore hinge on the ability of U.S. shale and OPEC to muster additional production. U.S. shale was laid low in the wake of the pandemic and has yet to fully recover, as shown in the following chart that breaks out shale production by yearly vintage. This is shale production. Uh, this is the big three U.S. shale basins. Bakken is coming here and it's kind of declined. It hasn't really been moving up quite dramatically anyway. Eagle Ford has already peaked in 2015 and it looks like it's in decline, uh, but holding. Permian looks like to be the only one that's really been increasing uh, very much uh, in the Permian Basin. They say that shale's growth rate going forward will be restrained compared to pre-pandemic levels, with only basin with significant growth prospects being the Permian Basin in West Texas and New Mexico. The Permian accounts for slightly more than half of total shale production. Per, uh, production from the other two major shale basins, the Eagle Ford and Bakken, is likely to remain flat, while shale production outside the big three basins is likely to decline. The Permian will therefore single-handedly face the burden of growing production enough to offset declines elsewhere, while also mustering the production needed to grow aggregate U.S. oil output. Looking on the right-hand side here, this is the total U.S. shale production uh, in total, those big three and whatever else. Over time, we've been moving on up over the years. We've hit a peak at 9 million. Now we're at 7.5 million. Will this increase? I don't know. This may remain flat. If it remains flat, I don't know where the extra barrels are going to come from if OPEC is tapped. We're going to get into OPEC here very soon. Quarterly CFO versus cap, uh, CapEx for public U.S. shale oil producers. Left to right in a declining fashion. From 2014 to 2021, CapEx is declining over time. It's not going up. I don't know how you're going to produce more with declining CapEx and inflation. Look at the best indicator of U.S. oil production outlook is the number of frack fleets deployed throughout the U.S. shale oil basins. The following chart from Kuros uh, shows that the number of frack fleets began falling in late 2018, well before COVID decimated activity in the shale patch. After plummeting in early 2020, the recovery has been far weaker than the dramatic oil price recovery since then would suggest. I don't have the that that chart. Oh yeah, I do. Frack fleet. Here it is. Frack, flack, uh, frack fleets active in U.S shale oil basins declining. It was declining before it. There's the huge decline, and now we're starting to come back just a little bit. Looking at OPEC supply, let's do this. Uh, and I'm just, I'll read this. Yeah. Uh, as shale production growth remains firmly below pre-pandemic levels, OPEC is having difficulty increasing production even now. This phenomenon uh, can be seen most clearly in the group's inability to meet the quotas set under the group's most recent production agreement. Beginning in July 2021, OPEC and its non-OPEC partners, collectively referred to as OPEC Plus, agreed to increase their aggregate production by 400,000 barrels per day each month through September 2022, at which point their production will be restored to pre-pandemic levels. But guess what? Not all is going well. Uh, Angolia, Nigeria, Azerbaijan, Mexico, and Malaysia have failed to meet their quotas for additional output. These members are holding back OPEC Plus aggregate's monthly production hike which has come in well short of its scheduled 400,000 monthly ramps. Since the OPEC Plus deal went into effect in July through October, the group was scheduled to have an additional 1.6 million barrels of day of supply. Instead, it has only mustered an additional 900,000 barrels per day. That's it. Here's the OPEC Plus production capacity versus quota. The difference is that they're failing to meet the quotas by 820,000 barrels. They are short. Looking over here with various OPEC members under producing, it falls to the members who can who can boost production to make up for the laggards in meeting the group's 400,000 barrel per day monthly supply addition. So far, however, they have failed to do so. Only Russia is overproducing its quota by a material amount. The net result is the OPEC Plus as a group only increased production by 240,000 barrels per day in October, according to the EIA. So they are underproducing. Uh, I don't think they've got the oil. I don't think they've got the production flow. So what does that mean? This is what it means. Stocks are now 200 million barrels below pre-COVID levels. 200 million barrels. Uh, this is it. This is the, the peak and then the decline and we're eaten into 
uh, inventories quite dramatically. This is going to put a lot of pressure on oil prices to go on up. Uh, products on water, crude on water, landed products, other landed crude. This is inventory everywhere and the best data that they, they have. Here is, I'll just read this, with demand outpacing supply, inventories are drawing. Since mid-2020, global demand has significant out, significantly outpaced supply. The ensuing supply deficit has caused oil inventories to draw down at the steepest rate on record. In August, inventories fell below pre-pandemic levels and have continued to fall consistently since then. OEC total uh, oil industry stocks are declining in 2021. We're off the page, guys. We're off the, the range of 2016 to 2020. We are way down here, sucking down our oil inventory. And here's the OECD total oil industry inventories. Looking at this, OECD inventories are at their lowest level point since early 2015, a full 250 million barrels below their five-year average. <laughs> that is insane. Uh, if they approach the minimum levels required for normal oil market operation, the market will enter a shortage. Since oil inventories are inversely correlated with oil price, the lower oil, the loyal inventory, lower inventories go, the greater the upward pres pressure on price. After adjusting for global demand, growth and in infrastructure additions since 2015 inventories don't have much further to fall until they are consistent with $100 per barrel oil prices. So I'm going to stop the video there. Uh, we're going to do a part two coming up. Uh, that's part one. Uh, we'll we'll continue it in the next video. Uh, if you guys like this content, give me a thumbs up. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. And uh, see, me at, see you in the next clip here for part two. Thank you.